Uh, today is February 13th, 2018, and we're here at the Thomas House Retirement Community in Washington, D.C. to interview Tina Hobson as part of the Lessons of the 60s, a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. The project focuses on Washington, D.C. area activists for the period 1960 to 1975. I'm John Hanrahan, and I'm joined by Lessons of the 60s Project Coordinator Ann Gallivan and by Peter Roof, who is filming this interview. <coughs> Uh, Tina is going to speak about her own activities and also about her late husband, Julius Hobson, the famed D.C. civil rights leader. Uh, Tina herself has a record of lifetime activism and achievement, and uh, I should say I have in front of me a piece of paper that is a mile long and very impressive uh, <laughs> of all of her achievements, which I'll just read a few of them here. But following 20 years of public service, Tina Hobson retired from the federal government in 1983 as a career senior executive to become executive director of the Solar Lobby and Center for Renewable Resources, later renamed Renew America, uh, organizations that were committed to safe, sustainable, cost-effective, and environmentally sound natural resource efficiency. She held positions as chairman of it and then as president before becoming a senior fellow on the Renew America Board of Directors also a member of the Board of Directors of the Rodale Institute, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, the Safe Energy Communications Council, and High Knob Utilities, uh, Inc. As I said, this is, uh, impre I mean, it would take up half the interview to read this because it's so impressive, but uh, wanted to, and, and Julius Hobson, uh, who was her husband, was progressive D.C. journalist Sam Smith wrote that Julius was, quote, as important to Washington in his way as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were to the nation. And I think all of us who were around at that time would say amen to that. Uh, Julius uh, grew up in segregated Alabama, served in World War II, and was awarded uh, three bronze stars. After, coming, after later coming to Washington, he served as president of the D.C. chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, from 1960 to 1964. And he ran more than uh, 80 uh, picket lines and some 120 downtown retail stores that discriminated in their refusal to hire African-American employees. And this resulted in the employment of 5,000 black workers during that four-year period, you know, an incredible impact on hiring practices. Under his leadership, the, a lot of other uh, positions uh, were, were uh, lobbied for and, and one for black employees. He won the historic Hobson v. Hansen lawsuit, which ended the racially biased track system in D.C. public schools and also outlawed uh, teacher uh, racial segregation, differential expenditures per pupil that favored white majority schools, and differential distribution of books and supplies. He is one of the key figures in the successful anti-freeway fight, a co-founder of the D.C. Statehood Party, and a member of the first elected Board of Education in 1968 and the first elected D.C. Council in 1974. So, Tina, let's get started by talking about your own background, where you grew up, went to college, when and why you came to D.C., and, and how you happened to meet Julius Hobson. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, it's a strange adventure, and I actually was born in Seattle, Washington. My father was in the Navy. And my mother said when he first looked at me, because I was born at seven months, he said, we'll never raise that one. <laughs> and so, he, but he was a great father. Uh, and so I lived everywhere, including in China and uh, in Japan and in the Philippines and so forth, as, as um, Navy families do. Um, I went to college at Stan I graduated from Stanford University in 19... Uh, 51, and did one year of graduate work with the Coro Foundation. I majored in urban uh, living and urban studies. And, um, but the most interesting thing was that I had a very, very heart-rendering divorce. I had children at the time, and I didn't know quite what to do. Um, and so eventually I was offered a job here in Washington, D.C., and I took my children, I brought my children back here to live because I thought we'd kind of start anew, and my family was very supportive. 
And um, little things happened, um, like uh, the, um, th there was a man who, on the newspapers and so forth, said the public utilities are discriminating against minorities and so forth. And so he said, I want you to punch when you get your next bill uh, on a card, punch holes in it. So I did. And I could not believe that 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 was a simple nonviolent thing to actually improve uh, the behavior of the utilities and black people could come out and work at the desks and he made a change. Now the other thing is we elected uh, the, well, we didn't elect. We had the first uh, city council was appointed, and I think Marion Berry was the chairman. Is that correct? Uh, or was it Walter Washington? Uh, Walter. It was Walter Washington, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Walter Washington was, uh, but I was driving across from Arlington, Virginia to, um, uh, to um, Washington, and I heard somebody on the phone say, this is Mr. Hobson. Mr. Hobson, isn't it terrific that we now have, instead of three people uh, working with Congress in uh, working on the, um, uh, the, the city government, that we now have a real council and with Mr. Washington, and we have a new start. And this voice said, well, instead of having... Uh, 11 people, uh, he said, we have, instead of having three people not represent us, we now have 11. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I invited him. I was working at NIPA, the National Institute for Public Affairs, which was a Ford-funded project. And I said, I need to get him as a speaker, because we brought in people from all over the country. Did you recognize that this was the same man who had done the punch card? Yes. The, yes, yeah, okay. I did. Yeah. And uh, so I and he came in to speak to these twelve people we brought in, who were all police chiefs or board of supervisors heads or so forth, to Washington to learn about Washington. And he would come and give a talk, uh, and he always was voted the most interesting speaker. And obviously he was because he could just he the the, the reason. Well, let me tell you. The first time he invited me out, he took me to his apartment and made dinner, okay? Good dinner. He was a good cook. That was impressive. As we walked out the door, he said to me, I want you to know that I want to marry you. Now, I know you're going to not be interested now, and he said, I know this will shock you, but he said, I want you to know that my, um, m m what I feel is honest and what I'm going to pursue and I want to let you know in advance and so forth. And I thought, my God, I've got two teenage boys, white boys, you know, and this is a big, big step. But he had several things going for him that I found out eventually. One, he's a good cook. I wasn't. <laughs> two, he didn't drink because he said that uh, he uh, would drink too much. So he never drank even when he was in the Army. Um, and, the, and then the other thing was, one day after we were married for just um, maybe three months, he said, you know, I don't think you're as neat as I am. And he said, would you mind if I cleaned the house on Saturday? And I... <laughs> I said, no, I don't mind. I picked stuff off the floor. I wasn't really bad, but he was better. So he cleaned the house on Friday. He made the meals during the week. I did the weekend. He helped shopping. He was a partner. Mm -hmm. So that's how I met him, and that's how we got together. That was the beginning of mm -hmm. our life together, which was I knew him 10 years, and we were married eight years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you started... Uh started dating, and at some point, I think the word got back to your uh, your boss or people where you worked with. Is that right? There was some uh, oh, feedback no. you got? Uh, oh, no. He ran for, uh, I think, the Board of Education the second time or something like that, and he lost. Mm -hmm. So... 
I said to the reporters, uh, we're going to get married. I thought I would change the subject. And uh, so in the newspaper, it said he lost the election, but these two are going to get married, you know, and isn't that interesting? And uh, so um, the minute I did that, I was told where I was working at the Civil Service Commission that I couldn't work there anymore because I was in charge of the federal women's program to eliminate discrimination against women, and that's the only fight Julius and I ever had. I even kicked the bathroom door once I was so upset with him because he didn't understand discrimination against women, but he did after we were married a couple of years. But the thing is that uh, we... Um, uh, the Civil Service Commission, I was told that I would... I couldn't... There was no way. It, it was such a bombshell that I was going to marry him that people wouldn't speak to me in the building because they were stunned, not because they didn't like me, really. So I went home and I asked Julius... We weren't living together, we didn't uh, at the time, but I asked Julius, um, what do I do about this? And he said, oh, they, just ask them, what's the law that says you can't work there? Just ask them, what, 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 what's causing this? And I had never thought of that, so I went back, and the senior official that I was talking to, I said, well, tell me what's the law that says I can't work here anymore, because Julius happened to be holding hearings on the Hill on discrimination against minorities, but he had added women by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, he uh, said uh, that they said, oh, uh, well, they said, uh, just tell them you want another job, uh, Julius told me. Uh, so I said, well, I'll take another job if this upsets you. So I got a better job <laughs> out of this when they had expected me to resign because I was working on eliminating discrimination against women and Julius was doing the same thing on the Hill and they felt that that was a conflict of interest and that was illegal. And so I learned a lot from Julius about not giving up. And what was the job you got? I got the job of training people coming into the, um, uh, to the uh, government work without, who had never worked before. There were a lot of welfare mothers who came in, and you would train them on the job instead of doing training in advance, mm -hmm. having training programs and then no jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the first time they tried that, and they also tried to do it uh, in the private sector, the government gave money for trying to bring people into jobs and training them there. And we did the best job. The government did the best job. And uh, um, I had people overlooking me all the time because I think they really would have liked to have gotten rid of me, but they really couldn't. This was still under the Civil Service Commission? Yes. Guess, yes, yeah. it was. Uh, so, uh, so that at some point then you were married, what, the year of 60? Uh, let's see, we were married in 69. And the uh, ceremony uh, was... was uh, the ceremony, Julius always said he was an atheist. I never really believed him, but that was okay. Um, but we were married by three ministers of different denominations, and uh, our children were there, and our friends were there, and it was just a lovely. And that was in 1969. They were all sort of activist ministers of... When oh, yes, they were. Like, mm -hmm. priests, right. Yeah. Yeah, we had a priest, and we had two others, and they were all activist ministers. In fact, Julius is buried. His, his uh, um, ashes are buried in the Georgetown um, church where I went to, um, the Georgetown Episcopal Church, where the Star Spangled Banner was written by one of their... And I thought that was an appropriate place for Julius because he integrated Georgetown anyway. <laughs> Can you say who the, who the three ministers were, the activist ministers? Uh, Sharp, Reverend Sharp, I think, from that church. And then there were two others, uh, one who, who handled his memorial service. I'll tell you, I'll think of that at 2 in the morning, and I'll call you. <laughs> I was just wondering if David Eaton was one of those. Yes, he uh, was. David, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, David Eaton was, and then there was one more. Reverend. Was the guy, St. Stephen's no. guy? No. Yes. Bill, Bill who? 
what's the sense the guy with the pine coffins? Uh, yeah. It was, um, well, uh, you, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, of course, before you knew uh, Julius, there was a lot of uh, activity that he was involved in, obviously, just from what I read there at the beginning. And, um, and of course, you heard about a lot of it later on. I mean, he essentially stores like Drug Fair, Giant, Safeway, A&P, Han, Shoes, Head Company, Woodward, and Motorola. But the rats were my favorite story. Okay, yeah, that's what I wanted. Yeah, tell about the rats. What he did. Well, the thing that, that I thought was just so creative, I mean, this was a really creative man, is in the poor sections of town, they were overrun with rats. Mm -hmm. And I think this is still when there were three people representing the government, and so the three, the, the three people were asked for money to get rid of the rats in the poor section of town. And the answer they gave was, no, we don't have the money. So Julius uh, got a, um, a uh, Subaru, uh, got something and put a cage on top. And I think he only had one rat, rat in the cage, but there could have been more than one. But anyway, he took some reporters, I don't know who they were, a couple of reporters with him, and drove over to Georgetown and uh, said that he was going, that in, the reporters asked him and he attracted people and they, he said, what are you going to do with those rats on the top of the car? He said, well, if they won't pay to get rid of the rats in one part of town, then we'll just equalize the rats. <laughs> so that there will be an equal number all over town. Well, the money came practically the next day to get rid of the rats. And I thought, you know, people who are nonviolent have to really be creative because it's so much easier to strike someone than it is to figure out how you make them laugh. Yes. And that's what he did frequently. He, he was also good at parlaying things that he didn't have and, and creating the impression that he did have them. In that case, and didn't you didn't you talk once about he had a supposed he had a parabola microphone or something to monitor the police? Oh yes, he's but he's he done a lot. Yes, <laughs> he would pretend like he had a whole slew of microphones to monitor the police, and he he was not. Uh, but his lies were very positive lies, uh, in a sense, um, because. They made us laugh. They made us uneasy because you never knew exactly what he was going to do. But the police liked him. I remember coming out of a spa, just having my hair done, and I looked at the newspaper, and I think it was the Star, uh, and the headlines were that he had been, um, he had been uh, arrested. And there was a picture of him getting into the paddy wagon. I got used to that. Um, because the thing is that he um, got on the bus and put in the wrong change because they'd up, you know, up the amount that it costs, and he felt it was too much for low-income people. And uh, so, but the police, he was always courteous with the police, and they were always courteous with him. Some, uh, time, I think it was in the interview, Charles Cassell, he talked, and you may have talked about it too, of, of him, sometimes they not arrest him when he wanted to be arrested. That's right. And he had to... Yeah. He went at the, the Georgetown Hospital, I think it was Georgetown, He, was, they had certain floors for black people and certain wings for black people and so forth. They even divided up the kids in the nursery, black babies here and white babies here. So Julius went in and uh, went to bed in the white ward and refused to get up. And there, you know, the, everybody collected in the lobby, and there were reporters, and he just said, I'm staying here. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he was arrested. I think he was thrown out. But mm -hmm. I don't think he was arrested, and they did begin to integrate the hospital. It's just sometimes you don't know what's not going on, and if somebody can bring it to your attention like that, you, why would they ever uh, divide up babies in a hospital by mm -hmm. color. I mean, that's just so outlandish that you can't believe it. Yeah, and some of these hospitals had very prominent business people on their boards, you know, John Heckinger and people like that, who was on the city council. He might have even been chairman. I'm not sure. Was he? Yeah, Heckinger supported Julius yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so yeah, so there were all these different sit-ins, lions uh, that achieved what he, he set out to do, which was to provide more jobs and uh, for for black people and less discrimination all around the city. Uh, when you were when you uh, got to know Julius, he was probably then right in the midst of Han Hobson v. Hansen case. Do you want to talk a little about that? Yeah, he was. Uh, I got to know him when the headlines said that he had, uh, the, the, the things I'd heard about him, plus that he was in the Hobson v. Hansen case. And that's really why I asked him to come over and speak to the, the 12, the group of 12 that we were uh, bringing into Washington to learn how to cope with, with problems, urban problems that they might have in their cities. And so, but the Hobson v. Hansen case was, uh, um, really uh, amazing in that there was a track system uh, here. That uh, the track system was that you could uh, you could not go to high school if you were put in a track that was the first or second track or both. There were four tracks. Uh, then two of them would lead to high school and two of them would not. And we knew of cases where parents actually sent their kids to out of state uh, to other places for the last two years of high school. So it was a very, very important case, and I, I just celebrated it with him. Uh, I wasn't part of it, did not help him, but we certainly shared the same goals. And he had lots of interesting, competent friends and uh, who he said sometimes could fit into a phone booth, if people know what that is these days. <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, so he won that case and then was on the Board of Education. And uh, we were married during that time, um, because we were married in 69. And, uh, but, uh, but we were, probably we were equally as active in imposing the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And um, I will never, uh, Julius spoke at all, uh, many of the, we went to everybody. He didn't care what group asked him to come. It could have been the, the Nazis. I mean, it could have been any, uh, not really, but it could have yeah. been Marxists or it could have been, uh, people who, but he was so adamant against the war that he would speak with any group uh, or represent any group at the big marches. And um, one time we were standing, I was facing out from the White House, and I was right next to the platform where he was speaking, and there were probably 2,000 people anyway or more. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, here's the microphone. And he turned around to me and said, you need to do this. You need to come and take it. And I had no idea what to do. Fortunately, I spoke in, in my job. So I got up on the, and looked at those 2,000 people. I have no idea what I said. But what Julius saw was gas, uh, the smoke going up at the end in the back. And that was part of what we eventually showed that the FBI uh, and the district police uh, and uh, were may well have been involved in. We had a case later mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, and Julius wanted to go and see who was doing it at that particular time. So he left me alone for a couple of minutes. So that was my biggest speaking engagement in my life. Yeah, and you, you don't remember what you said. <laughs> no, I don't remember. You're against what the war, though. Yeah. Yeah, because you and uh, Julius and a lot of other activists, local activists, were targeted by the COINTELPRO. The That's FBI's right. FBI's, which later came out. Right. And in your lawsuit. Which, right. Which, which we won. Which you won. That's right. And ACLU represented us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did win the case, we won money. Uh, not the 300000 they originally had agreed on, but it was for the fact that they distracted people. They, they told them to go someplace else, or they told them things were canceled, gave them misinformation, so that it was a negative in producing, uh, in having these protests. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, um, uh, we 
uh, Julius was litigious, mm -hmm. and I thought for a while that maybe that was not a good thing. I changed my mind because when you do something in law, you have to have the facts. Mm -hmm. And Julius dealt in facts mm -hmm. because he was an economist. Mm -hmm. And unlike some current people in government, um, you know, who don't do that, mm -hmm. uh, it was, to me, it was a good way of getting out facts. Even if you were going in the wrong direction, you could change directions and do something better. So, and so I began to appreciate it, and he also got the best lawyers, volunteered to help him on some of these things. I think on Hobson B. Hansen was William Kunstler. Yes, was David Clark other. was also helped him a lot. On that piece, yeah. yeah, and Kunstler was the the key person on the on the uh, Hobson B. Hansen case. Yeah. On the um, on the FBI's spying, they were trying to drive a wedge between. Black activists and anti-war activists right. and phonied up letters, I think, from Doug Moore to anti-war people to make it look like, I mean, there was right. to create tension between the two so that they wouldn't cooperate. Right. Well, and I think that Julius and I were a good pair and a good team because I wouldn't put up with that, and I did graduate from Stanford. Not that that's a big deal, but it is back here when you're, you know, you're... Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Julius and I were a team, and um, so to say that that uh, the driver wedge is pretty hard to do. Yeah. The, um, just tell a little bit about his style, because when you mentioned about the pictures of him getting arrested, there would be people that were scruffier looking. Julius described Julius in, oh, his, yeah. in his all in his appearance all the time. Yeah. Well, Julius was uh, the, the, the one thing that I really loved, had to smile about him, is he always wore a hat because he had a receding hairline. And so he always felt more comfortable with a hat on. And he always wore a suit. Now, his mother was a uh, principal of a school in Birmingham. And Julius always ironed his shirts, even if they came from the laundry. He was very, uh, very uh, he looked, he always looked good, uh, because that mattered to him, that he have a presence that looked good. I, in fact, I had to keep up with him sometimes. Um, but, and no matter where he went, he was comfortable. Uh, and he always wanted me to go. Remember, in those days, there, there were some black uh, men who had white friends, girlfriends, and so forth, and they were kind of hidden. Well, I would have liked to have been hidden because why would I want, when he's running for office, to go to a black church with him? Because that was not okay in those days, and I just didn't get him any votes. I would rather stay home and iron. But he would always take me. I mean, he never hid me, and I never hid him, which was a... There were some things we didn't do, like in driving, he would not stop where I might want to where there might be things for sale along the road or something. I mean, we were, he was concerned about um, uh, racism. And uh, we found out that uh, most of uh, my white friends thoroughly enjoyed him, and most, a lot of his black friends did not thoroughly enjoy me. And I don't blame them. Uh, some women told me, well, you've taken him away from us. And uh, and I can uh, I can understand that, um, but we had mutual friends. We had we worked in a mutual. Uh, we enjoyed it. We celebrated it sometimes, and we basically cried about it other times. He, he um, when you mentioned about him being litigious, there was a, another lawsuit, Hobson v. Hampton, the discrimination against African Americans, Mexican Americans, and women. I think you said you had a certainly a role. Oh yes, pushing, I did. Uh, pushing that uh, yes, he did not. He felt that um, uh, women were not. Uh, his wife was. Uh, his first wife was very. Uh, uh, had lots of education. Was just an amazing lady, and so were his children. And um, he just felt that women had, and his mother had been a principal at, at a school, so he felt there was not any different discrimination. It was all minority discrimination. 
and um, and when I got the job as the director of the federal women's program, I got the seat behind my boss's secretary, and I was not part of EEO because they didn't want white women to associate with black people. I, I swear to God, this is the Civil Service Commission in those days. Mm -hmm. Now, that changed, obviously, but that's why they were so upset when I announced mm -hmm. my engagement to Julius. Um, but... Uh, so I guess um, in the Hampton situation, he had hearings, and I think that there. I think that's why. Remember, they had a memorial service for. He called it a memorial service for Julius, although he was alive. And there were about two thousand people who came, and they were all colors and all ages, and they were people who basically may not. You may not have liked his style. I did because it was nonviolent, and I would do anything that was nonviolent. Uh, and but it was upstaging people. It was calling you for what was really, you know, uh, it, there was nothing hidden with Julius. He was open, and um, uh, and I think that uh, that. But I did teach him. I. I by data, by giving him information to show that women, uh, for instance, in the federal government at that time, 80 percent of the women were GS sixes and below. There were very few at top levels. And uh, the discrimination not only in the federal government but in poverty and in all kinds of things. So once he caught it, he never questioned it. He just included women all the time. When you mention about the um, so-called memorial service, the reason that that was being you know, what tell about his, what he was diagnosed with and oh how yes, it came about. Yeah. well, we were married. I knew him in 1967 when I was at the Civil Service Commission. Uh, we were married in 1969. In 1971, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the spine, basically. And I remember going to the hospital with him. He had pneumonia, and we thought he just had pneumonia, but the doctors <coughs> diagnosed him with multiple myeloma. So naturally what he told me to do is go down to the library in the hospital and figure out what multiple myeloma is. So he was still in the hospital when Joan Baez announced that she was going to have the Ring Around Congress uh, to uh, opposing the Vietnam War, I believe. And so, um, but the, um, many of the black leaders opposed her doing that because they said the money that it would cost to, to deal with the ring around the Congress that she was planning would, uh, would feed a lot of black people and help in the poverty areas. So they came out in the paper and objected. And Julius was in the hospital, and he called a uh, he called a press conference in his room. And incidentally, we had a um, Secret Service agent outside the room because Julius was running for vice president on uh, Dr. Um, Spock's party, the People's Party. So here we were with all of this going on, and uh, Julius in the press conference said, this is where we have protests. This is the capital of the United States. This is where people come to, change, to make the changes that are important in our society. She must have the ring around the Congress, and everybody, and I'm not get, his words are much better yeah. than mine, but he stopped them. Uh, and, and, and Joan Baez had her ring around the Congress, which was very successful. And at this tribute to Julius, his memorial service, as he said, she came and sang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was, um, uh, I think you said uh, some reporter asked Julius why Mayor Washington wasn't attending. Uh, yeah. The point of right. Uh, yes. Uh, while we were, uh, they had a program and it was a darling program. Um, there were a lot of people there, and uh, someone asked him, why didn't Mayor Washington come? And um, he said, 
Now, was it Mayor Washington or Marion Barry? It was, it was Washington. It was yeah, Washington, Washington. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, he said, well, he said, <clears throat> uh, if he had a memorial service like this, I wouldn't go to his. <laughs> so he doesn't have to come here, you know. But he said it in a nice way. He never yeah. said it in a <laughs> nasty voice. Was, um, you mentioned his running with uh, Dr. Spock on the... Um, People's Party. The People's Party. It was sort of fortuitous, wasn't it? Didn't Spock send him someplace to... Uh... Oh, yes. yes. Uh, Spock had asked him to be his vice president, and he ran on the People's Party, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. But he was diagnosed almost immediately. But we did have a Secret Service person mm -hmm. who was outside the door, and I told him to go home, that there was no point in the taxpayers uh, paying for it. Dr. Spock is the one that found the doctor at Sloan Ketterling in New York. Not the top doctor, but a doctor that he felt had the kind of experience that would be most helpful to Julius. Mm -hmm. And he did get the right doctor, and GW, or I don't want to say the wrong hospital, the hospital Julius was here in, um, in D.C., did not like the, the treatment that Julius was going to get because he didn't have to stay in a private room and, you know, have all these different things. And Julius lived for longer than anybody in his particular group, mm -hmm. which I think included Martha Mitchell. Remember, she was the attorney general's wife when right. she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma too, but she lived about two years. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was ironic that they had this big event for him and then he went on and got elected to the council. Got elected to the council. And stuck around. For That's a while. right. <laughs> and you know, every time I walk across the street, I think of Julius because he's the one. Because I, we had to push him in a, in a wheelchair to his work. He had a very nice staff, but he's the one that got the loops in the in the um, on the curbs, mm -hmm. so that wheelchairs. He's the one that passed mm -hmm. that first bill. Important. Yeah, it was very. It's a very important, particularly when I live in a retirement community. Particularly with, I guess, mainly white people and the Washington Star and the Washington Post. Julius was a fire-breathing radical, and you had to watch out for him. Tell us more about his own personal style about poetry. Uh. And Oh, yeah. Um, in the first place, one of the things, Julius had a wonderful sense of humor. So every time he'd make me mad, he'd make me laugh <clears throat> in the end. But when he was in the military as an artillery spotter going up the boot of Italy, he um, d didn't drink, again, because he said I would drink too much if I did. When other people would, when his friends would go to bars, uh, when they had time, he would go to the opera in uh, Italy. He knew a number of operas. He loved them. He uh, could tell me the whole story and who wrote them and where they were and where he saw them. Now, unfortunately, I'm not an opera lover, so we didn't carry that. But the other thing he did is an artillery spotter up in the air with a pilot uh, he memorized poetry, and he only had a book of English poets. So he could entertain me for two hours just memorizing, stating the poets, but he'd always tell me the story of the poet. And he, I remember uh, that before he came home from Italy, um, he uh, went to see Flanders Field, because we all know the poem, when Flanders fields, the poppies grow. And he, uh, but I always enjoyed his poetry. And uh, because he could, but it was mostly the English poets. And I think the book is at the Martin Luther King Library that he carried with him as an artillery spotter. The, um, who were uh, some of his friends or closest political allies? I've got a several names here, but I was just, uh, uh, I think you talked about... Sammy Abbott was one of the closest, mm -hmm. and uh, so was, and Sterling Tucker. Sterling was good because he was not judgmental. Mm -hmm. He seemed to be able to balance Julius. Mm -hmm. um, Josephine Butler mm -hmm. was another close friend. 
Um, yeah, and Charlie and Charles Cassell, uh, Warren Morris, mm -hmm. and um, there were. Uh, he had people with a lot of talent uh, who seemed to be able to meet together and work together without a whole lot of time. You know, now when I call a meeting, it, it takes me half a day to get people. When he, can you come? No, I can't come that day, and something else. And that Julius was able to do things very quickly and in a very. The, the, he just seemed to have a. Um, a the, the, there was just a shared dream, I guess, or a shared caring and a shared a shared knowledge, and they were all knowledgeable. And they were. He, he said that he could. Uh, you know. Uh, he, I don't know. He was a good organizer in his fashion. Yeah, Nobody funny. else could organize like he did, but yeah, no, I, I get these contrasting views sometimes of when he mentioned about not being able to fit all of his allies in a phone booth or yeah. something, and but yet turning out large numbers to huge pick numbers up stores downtown. Yeah, huge numbers uh, for anything that he did, and um, uh, I was amazed because he didn't spend a lot of time on the phone either, mm -hmm. and we didn't have computers. Uh, Internet. so, yeah. but he did, he, he was a, you know, he was an economist and he just had the right contacts and, and he'd lived here for 20 some years and worked in the community. So I think he had his, you call one and they call others. I mean, we all did that. And the newspapers, the newspapers paid attention to him so he could announce something in the press. That's how he got to people. The, uh. Among your uh, possessions, I know, is a letter that he wrote to his mother back in the 50s before he was sort of right. really active uh, in social and racial, racial justice issues. It's, I, th that letter is one of my treasured letters because he said, Mom, I'm sorry I failed. I failed at Tufts. I failed at, which he hadn't failed. Uh, this was before World War, uh, before World War II. And he said, you know, I haven't done anything, I haven't done well in school, and I want to be some, I want you to be proud of me. And it was just a wonderful letter uh, of a, you know, a 20-year-old who just says, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm going to do and so forth. And then uh, it was, and I wish I had a copy of it here for you, but it was one of those that we put in the uh, in the Martin Luther King Library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it was it's astounding to read it because it's to see what he then did become. Uh, yeah, the, and the he, he but he said and he said I'm going to work hard to be some someone that you would be proud of. I want to contribute to the world, to the earth. His interest in the environment preceded mine. Yeah, you, before the interview, you showed me a, a, a speech or an address that he gave. 1971, I guess. It was. Yes, it was in 71. And it was about to the Sierra Club, mm -hmm. and it was on electric utilities, and and how they were not doing the right thing in terms of their customers and uh, and the damage to the environment. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, I don't remember is you we interviewed Charles Cassell, and he had some great stories about being on picket lines with Julius, but. Um, Paul Bennett, there was some, maybe you told me about some good cop, bad cop routine that he and Julius had where Julius would be the, the reasonable, quote unquote, reasonable one. And yeah, Julius had little, I don't remember much of that, but mm -hmm. Julius did, did set up situations for, um, uh, for people uh, like, like the rats. I mean, that was totally, mm -hmm. you know, off the cuff. Uh, but he set up the situation. He got the car and he got the rats, and I think they drowned the rats, or one rat. <laughs> there were, um, I, I saw that you and Julius, and I know, know the answer to this, and I'll have an organization called Washington Institute for Policy. Quality Education. What was the focus of, of that? That was when he got sick. He uh, had worked for the government, as you know, for HEW at the time. 
it was called H-E-W, and um, uh, when he got sick, he could not go back to work, uh, obviously, full-time. He had to leave the government, so we set up this organization so that he could... He, he won the Hobson v. Hansen case, but winning a case doesn't mean much unless something follows through, unless somebody monitors how you're going, is the track system being eliminated? Is the, all the white kids go to Georgetown and the other kids go someplace else and you're integrating the population and you're busing kids to integrate the population? Are these things happening? So Julius had an office and uh, we called it that name and uh, that was his way of monitoring the Hobson v. Hansen case. Um, and so he was then on the council again seventy. He was on the council. And the interesting thing was, I think when he ran for, and I'll double check this, but I'm quite sure about it, when he ran for uh, the, the uh, and was elected to the Board of Education, I think it was the first time in 95 years that anybody had been elected uh, to, in D.C., to a a board, and um, uh, the the last person to be elected was, um, and I'll call you at two in the morning and let you know the name. Um, and I'll think of it. Uh, a very famous person who was during the Civil War, black. Um, uh, but Julius was the second one elected, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, and I was very very proud of him for that. Although. He never talked about himself. Julius didn't uh, d didn't talk about himself very much. He also didn't care about money. We had to be careful to pay all the bills because neither of us cared about money. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, we had jobs that would pay for what we did and what we wanted to do. But uh, money was never a goal for Julius. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I wanted to go back a little to the letter to his mother uh, that when he was in his 20s. And you met him many years later. Do you or did he have any realization of what was the motivating factor there that made him become somebody? Is there any sort of, was there any particular event or was it yes. all internal on his part? Um, what? What, uh, thank you for asking me that question. One, I think he cleaned the house and made the dinner because he had more energy than I did. Mm -hmm. Julius had a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, f some people do. Uh, and um, th he was very angry that his daughter was put in the lowest track. Um, and the tracks were often picked by the darkness of your skin. Had nothing to do with your intelligence or anything. And he started the Hobson v. Henson case because of his daughter being arbitrarily placed in the lowest track. She went on to graduate from college. Um, but he was furious with that. I think he just saw hurt and despair and problems and just couldn't understand why somebody wasn't doing something about him. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just that, that kind of a situation. Um, and I think that he, remember he was in, um, um, he came from Birmingham and that's where those children, those girls were. Uh, he, he saw um, he saw the tragedies, but he saw them as being possible to fix. In other words, he just didn't give up. So he, if if one day he would, he wanted one time, he wanted all poor people to declare bankruptcy, mm -hmm. so then they wouldn't be poor anymore, you know. And anything they got, they could get rid of all their. He he would go through, you know, can we do this, can we do that, and he would talk to the people. Because to him, you could fix these things. And I think that was, and also he had a great sense of, if he hadn't had a good sense of humor, he wouldn't have survived. Mm -hmm. um, but he made fun of things. And uh, I don't know what else except that energy and the fact that he both personally and socially was upset with the, the treatment. Oh, I know. The other, I'll tell you one other thing. 
Um, the white superintendent in Birmingham came to uh, the mother's black school where they were going to sing, uh, to sing a song for this white superintendent in Birmingham that came to his mother's black school. And so they sang, and they did a great time. They, they were great and so forth. And he said the first thing he remembered is that white superintendent said, there must be a special place in heaven for you. And he thought, why is there a special place in heaven for me? You know, why isn't it for everybody? You know, and he wasn't talking about specifically the music, but I remember that's a story that Julius to told me. His experience in the segregated military. Oh, yes. Yes, he felt very terrible in the military because uh, until Truman... Um, uh, took away the, uh, the, the, he said that he saw white men who would not accept black blood die. And he said, I never could understand why they did that. And that that was, and Julius was, he cared about everybody. He cared about me a lot. And um, I, I just feel that in his fashion, even though he suffered a lot when he was ill for that many years, and we went through ups and downs. But uh, he just wanted the world to be better for everybody. Mm -hmm. During that period of his illness, like before you were working for which agency? Uh, that was before I worked for the Department of Energy. So Health education. Yeah, uh, no, I did not work yeah, for He uh, worked. Yeah. For health, education, and welfare, I worked for the. Um, yes, I did. I worked for the Federal Energy Agency, mm -hmm. and I worked for the Civil Service Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, anyway, I I actually had the insurance for Julius because he was then. We had our own little business, so he could implement the Hobson v. Henson case and work on anything else he wanted, mm -hmm. plus the the city council. As a, as a person who ran for public office and won a couple of times in his case, uh, and it was pretty well known, he was an avowed atheist and a Marxist economist. And married to a white woman. And married to a white woman. Yeah. And still occasionally won. Yes, he did. <laughs> he it, was on the council when he died. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The city where minister's endorsement was vital, uh, but he obviously did have some uh, ministers or rabbis or priests. But the, the, yeah, yeah, but not, the, yes, but the, somehow he could say something like to Bill Raspberry, you know, you shouldn't think that Nixon was a great president because he spoke to you once or something like that. I think that uh, people liked him even though he sort of, took away their foundation for a minute, yes. you know, but they, but he was never mean about it, and he wasn't like, I don't like you, you know, he didn't hate anybody, um, he just hated not caring, he hated violence, we never owned a gun, even though we were threatened a few times, and my children went to um, boarding school while uh, they were still in, in high school, and in order to get them out of the, the problem time. But uh, he was, I don't know, his energy, not that he was perfect um, at all, because he wasn't, but uh, none of us are. But he wasn't mean. That's the thing. He, he was able to walk in your shoes. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us about some of your own activities during this period, and as I think I mentioned in the opening, that you continued your activism right on down to today here at Thomas House, yeah. environmental issues, uh, women's rights issues. Oh, so. I would be happy to tell you, because we haven't completely solved one problem. Uh, when I came here to Thomas Circle, to this uh, th this retirement community, 
we decided we had 18,000 square feet on the roof that were unused and that we should put a green roof up there. So we got a lot of the people here and the um, Architectural Foundation, and we worked for two years on uh, a green roof and got lots of great help including the District of Columbia offered us $200,000 to put on, to help toward putting on a green roof. The problem is we have a non-for-profit owner. We've had two owners since I've been here, and Carlisle, and now it's Bridges uh, Investment Company, and they just don't see a green roof. They're just not environmental. They give money to other things. And uh, so we haven't convinced them yet but that's something that I certainly have been working on with everybody here. And um, the other things that we did, um, uh, we, I moved out to Front Royal, Virginia for a while. And in Front Royal, Virginia, there are eight Democrats, uh, if they all got together, or, or there were at that time. And it was kind of a poor community. Uh, low-income community and uh, with a polluting, uh, um, used to make nylon parachutes, you know, was one of the factories out there. So I got to work with a small community and really grew to like it a lot. Was this um, before or after Julius's death? After his death, after. way after his okay. death, after I was thrown out of the, yeah, I was thrown out of the uh, government uh, and what was that for? Um, let me think here a minute. But I did get um, the, uh, the, I was in the government and uh, at the Department of Energy. Um, I was, oh, I was director of the, uh, first director of the Appliance Efficiency Program. You know those things you have on your, mm -hmm. uh, that say how much energy the appliance is yeah. used? Well, I was uh, director of that. Uh, the first one, I had engineers working for me, and uh, I, fortunately, uh, and we put out the first appliance efficiency, and I was head of consumer affairs also. But I did something, anyway. Um, and so they were trying to, oh, uh, um, the, the, everybody's always trying to get rid of me, so <laughs> it's not a big deal. But uh, they, um, I won again, another lawsuit, and uh, so I got my retirement, and I got everything, ACLU supported me. Oh, it was on the... Um, uh, Hmm. But in any event, everything worked out fine mm -hmm. for everybody. But it was another struggle. I know what I did. Uh, the um, uh, we had a, oh yes, all right, it's coming back to me. We had a uh, uh, a new president, and um, <clears throat> and it was um, Reagan, I think, and. Uh, I, had, I was in charge of the newsletter at that time that went out, and I got one of the um, members of Congress to write, a Republican member of Congress, to write a wonderful article on how nuclear energy was bad <clears throat> or was difficult because it could be used for wrong things and so forth. And everybody was upset that I got him, but he was a Republican, so I had every right to. In fact, I can even show you the article. But... Uh, the, they tried to get rid of my job, but uh, they couldn't. And um, so, in any event, uh, I left the Department of Energy, which, oh, when we also had um, Sunday and Earth Day, mm -hmm. you know, and we really got to do a great deal. And I wish in my mind I could clearly tell you why I had to that last fight. But the last fight was perfectly okay, and I won it again. So with Julius, I learned to do things because of Julius taught me how to do a lot of things and just ignore some of the stuff. And uh, so anyway, it worked out happily and um, for me and for everybody else. And that's what you want to me. That's what I learned from Julius, too, is leave everybody okay. 
you don't want to say these are bad guys and these are good guys because the bad guys may become good guys and the good guys may become bad guys. So anyway. So this newsletter, of the newsletter, one of the prime uh, missions of the energy department is nuclear, nuclear energy. energy. Yes. So it, it is sort of a right. provocative. It was a provocative right. thing yeah. to do, and I chose a Republican right. to do it, right. so they couldn't really. So they actually they took all threw all of those away that hadn't been sent out, mm -hmm. uh, and um, so it caused a major problem. But I had a good staff. And uh, sometimes you just have to do those things, you know. They're just the right thing to do at the time. And, and Julius helped, but I don't want to leave every, anybody with the idea that we were perfect. We were, uh, none of us are, and all of us have our little ups and downs, like Julius lied about his age. <laughs> You know, he, and I didn't know it until I got his, uh, his war records, and he was actually born in, in uh, uh, 1918, 1919, and he, he was actually born, he said he was born in 1922, mm -hmm. so that's a little thing, and there are other things that, uh, uh, you know, we, we're all in a hurry, we all, but it was an adventurous life, and I think it was a contributing life, and I think it's, uh, my feeling is that it's disappointing now to see us go backwards uh, and to give up on some of these idealistic things that we saw working a little bit. Uh, and it's very hard to hold on when people are dividing people, that you're the bad guys and you're the good guys, which we didn't do in those days as much. You dislike the war, but you didn't dislike the people who were told to run that, to, who were in the war, the soldiers and the, the people. This is interesting that you said that, because I was just trying to formulate a question about, you know, sort of summing this up. Like, what, was, what was it about those years in the, starting in the late 50s through the mid-70s that sort of, in, I mean, there's always a lot of fighting and contention. But, yeah. But what was it about that was so special about those years that people could get together and do real things? Um, there was something very exciting about being here in Washington, D.C. in the 60s. It seemed the change, when it started happening, happened real fast. But how do you see the difference these days? I see the that? difference because, and I, and I have been depressed over the difference. And so it, it have people here in this building uh, because we couldn't do more. I see the difference be, because we had a goal of improving life in ways that we could touch and see for everybody. Yeah. Um, we may not like a person or two, and Julia certainly didn't. I remember little Lord Fauntleroy, I mean, among other things. But to Delegate <laughs> Yeah, Fauntleroy. right. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is, we were, we didn't focus on the negatives, and, t and, and we had little successes that kept us going because we could see something change that was made things a little better and um, I think that uh, I think it's a very different period I think that we were able to there wasn't the hate uh, and the, the awkwardness and the there wasn't the inequality either Oh, there, was some, but there, are two, there are two things I will leave you with. One is I think, and Julius would agree with this, I think that the two most dangerous things that we're facing now is the inequality, mm -hmm. is one. And the second one is uh, the environment mm -hmm. and climate change. So those are the two things that I now feel are the most important areas to work on. As you were talking, I was thinking about one thing we touched on here, the, the freeway fight, which united people across race and class and where you lived in the district or in the suburbs. And that was in a period of, of fairly big turmoil, but people got together who normally wouldn't have gotten together. That's right. And they had no power. They had no representation. They had nothing to yeah. back it up. And Julius was a 
a part of that. So. Yes, and Julius didn't have any power. You know, he really didn't have any power except that what came from inside of him. Because he had no, he didn't have a group that only worked with Julius on things. He had the highway, he had the schools, he had, you know, all kinds of things that he was interested in and all kinds of groups that were affected. And I think that that was one of the blessings of that time. But I agree, I agree that the time is so bad right now. Uh, you just feel so sorry because of the income inequality is my basic, I, I think that is the worst problem we have we uh, economically. We should wrap up in a minute, but uh, one thing, you know, it's well outside the 60s and 70s, but tell about your demonstration here the day after the ah, Trump inauguration. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. We've got to get that. Oh, yeah. yes. The, um, we, um, uh, because we're, we have about 135 people in independent living, but many of them have wheelchairs and walkers. So we couldn't participate in the Women's March the day after the inaugural of, of President Trump. Mm -hmm. So we decided we were going to have our own uh, Women's March out here at Town Circle. So we got, we bought lots of posters like Honk if you think everybody should have health care. Uh, we had all kinds of funny posters that people, and we had about 24 of us out there with wheelchairs and walkers uh, with our, our things, and we put, and we attached them to wheelchairs, and we had hundreds of people coming through uh, Thomas Circle to go to the main event. And one of the ladies with a walker said, I've never been so blessed. She said, everybody would come by and say, bless you, you know, <laughs> for doing this. And we, it was one of the most remarkable days, uh, I think. And my son and family came up to help get it organized. The people, the management here, didn't want us to do it. They were, they didn't, they'd never been in a protest. They felt somebody would get injured, but we did it anyway. And we had a lot of fun, and now they use it to say we've done it. So, uh, and we'd do it again. Is there anything we haven't addressed that you'd like to summarize? In uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, no, I don't. I don't. Th I think that um, these aren't just happy stories. They leave some people along the way, and I think that um, uh, that some people can take. I always felt protected with Julius um, because between the two of us, we could pretty much organize it. But a lot of people can't do that, uh, and. It's just that we happen to have the, the circumstances, the, the background and the experience and the so forth, but, but you got to be careful. We always had people behind us who would come and pick up the pieces or notify somebody or something. You, I just don't want people to say that this is easy and isn't it fun because... It's worthwhile, but you've got to find your leader, whatever leader who can help to protect the, the group that you're trying to, to, or the project you're trying to deal with. You just, you know, you, you just need that. You need somebody who's not going to throw you off the roof uh, when something happens. So I guess I would say I'd like to, us to go keep going in this direction because it made you happy. It gave you, uh, it, 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 it made living worthwhile. We want to go in that direction, and we're just going to have to find a new way of doing that, I think. And so I guess I'd like to leave that. Okay, well, thank good. you so much. Thank right. you. Can I, can I ask one question? Yes. Sure, why not? Yeah. I'm sort of curious. Um, the um, current administration and people who support them seem to have some sort of Nostalgia reference for reverence for the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Now this it's a old it's a decade before your, your right. subject matter. I graduated from college in '51. Okay, so but thinking back um, about 
about the 50s or 60s? Right. What did you like? What would you like us to return to? And what are you glad that's gone? <laughs> <laughs> when I graduated you from... Like yeah. 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 That's a good, yeah. very good question. When I graduated from college, there were no black people on campus except in the International House. The, depart the uh, law school wasn't, it was accepting very few women. Um, there was, racism abounded. You didn't even notice it. It was so accepted kind of thing. And I was in California at that time, too. Um, women, when I went to get a job with the federal government, they told me that... Um, uh, because I wanted to work with the government in California, they said, we're sorry, but um, we take uh, men first because they have to, um, uh, they have to support families. Seven years later, I was supporting my own family. You know, they, we did not even, and, and we didn't question it yeah. in those days. Mm -hmm. That was okay. Yeah, they have to support that families. Mm -hmm. And then I was here, I was supporting a family. That's why I got into that. And uh, it was a terrible, it was a good time, uh, it was a good time to have a young family and to be white and to have a job. But for everybody else, it wasn't. Uh, and uh, so, oh, I don't know, but that's a very good question because that's what the Trump people are looking at. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and nobody bothered you because... They, there weren't drugs, there wasn't all this, uh, they're, they're turning the TV on and w watching all day some, or, or being able to, I think we used to listen to three different um, networks. networks, and now you just pick your network, and if you just want to watch Fox, you never get any other point of view, you know, so I think it was a simpler time in a way. Uh, the, the remember that we doubled our population when Kennedy was president. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was president. The whole population doubled has, has doubled since then. So we have more people to push into smaller spaces with less interesting jobs. Um, so I don't know. But those are things to think about. Anything you should return back to? No. <laughs> no. That's what they want. That's what they want. That's what they want because it was simpler and you were treated fairly if you were white, had a job, and, an, and a reasonable education. And you knew who was in charge. Yeah, God. you knew who was in charge. Debbie I, has a question. I, I'd like to make a comment about Julius Hobson. Um, I worked for him, and I'm somebody who likes to talk a lot. Oh, let me just say, this is Debbie Hammerhan speaking. Yes. <laughs> right. And I just wanted to say that even as a talker, I never had to talk because what Julius had to say about something was the last word. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was absolutely brilliant in capturing the issue right. and in explaining it. And then there was silence. You never had people fighting no. over what we were doing because he was so brilliant mm -hmm. at, at um, laying it out. And to this day, and I've explained this, said this to, to Tina many times, I miss his voice. Yes. Even though it's years later. Yeah, yeah. I hear it too. I always waited to hear what Hobson had to say because I knew that was going to be the best take yeah. on what was going on. And well, sometimes uh, it was the funniest too. Yeah, well, absolutely. And absolutely. the other thing is, I think it comes back to your, your thing. I think Trump talks that same way to a certain group of people in the United States. Julius could explain yeah. to us in language we understood and give us the picture in a way that we could understand it. Trump does that for a certain group, only he lies a lot, yeah. you know. And Julius, right. did, I don't think Julius lied, really, unless right. it was on something. But, but, Tina, he and perhaps his... Um, uh, study of poetry and opera and many other f sources of inspiration, but he spoke with such, um, it wasn't just he was clear, but he was also 
interesting to listen to, mm -hmm. as though he were a poet, or as though he were um, some kind of a, of a um, what do you want to call it, one of those speakers that, that, that um, are supposed to... Yes, motivational, the motivational speakers. speakers. Yeah, but he wasn't trying he to He wasn't, do it. Yeah, no. Yeah. But that was the way it, it came out, and he motivated people without even trying. Well, he, he was... Yeah. yeah. How about that, speaking of sort of... Say something pithily, you know. That, yeah. yeah. How about that? Somebody want to say the quote about the uh, appointed versus elected uh, yes. city council? Somebody so want to city council, story? right? Can you tell that story? Yeah, I love that story yeah. because I what was listening. Yeah, what's, say what it is because well, the, that's, that's, that's a, the, this is the be one of the best stories. Yeah. yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, the, one of my favorite stories is when I was living in Arlington and driving across the water for to work in Washington. I heard before I knew Julius, uh, and I heard him uh, say uh, to a reporter on the news that uh, when the reporter asked him, "What do you think of the new council?" Uh, that. City council. Uh, yeah, we have a city council for the first time instead of the three people who used to monitor and say everything, uh, make all the, the, the decisions about, uh, uh, about Washington. Uh, isn't it great uh, for the first time we have this and so forth? And, and Julius in, said, instead of having three people not represent me, I now have 11 people, 11 people who do not represent me. me. And that was the end. Nobody said anything more. He always referred to home rule as home fool. Yeah, didn't, right. Uh, didn't really oh, I didn't even around. know that. Oh, so, that? Oh. yeah. And he, uh, but uh, when we were together, we spent a lot of time on poetry. And things like that. Uh, and he was, you know, uh, and he was very down to earth on cooking and shopping and all those sorts of things. So it was just a regular life, mm -hmm. you know. But he had a sense of humor about everything. That's the one thing that I thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah. yeah.